If you would, find a copy of the scriptures, whether a hard copy that you have near you or an electronic version that you can find your way over to Matthew 25, the gospel of Matthew chapter 25. We'll be there in just a few moments. As I listen to that last song, a couple of things occurred to me. One, I am so glad that the sacrifice and payment of the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient. What do I mean by sufficient? There were a lot of hard questions we just sang about, weren't there, just now. There were some questions of, have I done enough? There were some questions in that song about being enough or doing enough and of course, the answer is always no. But it's always going to be that way. The enough part, the sufficiency part of securing our right standing before God happened right there on the cross. The enough part happened when Jesus gave his life for you and me and rose again the third day victorious over sin and death. I'm so glad of that. Now, the however part of that is that stands, that sufficient sacrifice stands as tremendous motivation to give what we have back to the Lord. There's where the enough part comes. Now, Never, ever, 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 ever will what we do ever cross a T, dot an I, or be enough to gain anything with God. And that's not the motivation nor the, nor the, the, the pursuit. The pursuit is to live our lives for the glory of God because we can. Because he has made it possible on the cross so that we can. And you know what? There are going to be times when we trip up and we fall and we struggle in life. There's the sufficiency for us to get back up and keep going for the glory of God. That really kind of leads in also to the series that we've been looking at over the past few weeks, and that is, we've got issues, but God's got solutions. Now, the ultimate solution was provided for us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, imputed to our account because of the cross and resurrection of Jesus, because of his finished work on Calvary. There's the ultimate solution but it does not mean the struggle does not continue even into the Christian life. Right? Did any of you accept Christ and stop struggling? If you did, please come see me and tell me your secret. But I can say that jokingly because I know that there is nobody like that. I know that we all accept Christ and still experience struggles with sin. We are no longer under the condemnation and penalty of sin. We are no longer under... Uh, a defeated control of sin, but we still struggle with sin. Paul talks about sin warring in our members. I mean, the Apostle Paul, one whom God used to pen a large majority of the New Testament, even himself said, the things that I want to do and I know to do, I find myself not doing. And the things that I don't want to do, but no, I should, like, I sh and I know I shouldn't be doing, that's what I find myself doing. You, 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 can you identify with that struggle of Paul's? I can too, because we have issues. But in the Christian life as well, God's got solutions. And where do we find God's solutions? In the provision of his word. 
God has provided what we need in His sufficient Word. We looked a while ago, uh, I guess it was last week, at 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 15, that talks about the Scriptures that we've known as a child, which are able to make us wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And we said this last time, that God's word is able to confront our issues. It's valuable for our struggle with issues. And obedience to scripture results in victory over our issues. And I want to say this, the sufficiency of, for our issues of life is the sufficiency of God's word. This is the provision for the issues of life. God's got solutions. We started off talking about anxiety and worry in Matthew 6. Then we went to anger management done God's way. We used uh, some, we we looked at some of the teaching from Ephesians 4. Today, we're going to look at breaking the pattern of procrastination. And we're going to go to Matthew 25 in just a moment. The content for this series is from a series of booklets by Phil Mosier on biblical strategies for the issues of life. And the the one that I'm using today is called Taking Back Time, Biblical Strategies for Overcoming Procrastination. These are little, very easy to read uh, resources. If you're interested, let us know, or we can send you a link and you can order them yourselves. They're fairly inexpensive but super helpful resources, and that's where the content for today's uh, teaching is coming from. So let me ask you this. When I just announced the title, Breaking the Patterns of Procrastination, I wonder if immediately in your mind you said, huh, I don't really procrastinate. I'm a pretty diligent person, so this is not for me. Or if in your mind you thought to yourself, oh, no. I was hoping to put this one off till a later time. No. Um, I think you're going to see as we examine Scripture today that we all deal with procrastination in one way or another in such a way that has become an issue in our lives. And at best is not God's best in his design for our Christian life. And he's got solutions in his word to provide that renewal of thinking so that we don't go down a road that is not God's best for us. So I guess what we need to do, first of all, is define procrastination. And I'll start very generally with a dictionary.com definition. Procrastination, according to dictionary.com, is putting off or delaying, especially something requiring immediate attention. I think we all kind of had an idea of what the definition of procrastination was. It's, it's putting off. It's delaying. Most thoughts and discussions about procrastination address one's misuse of time or some need for better time management. But let me ask you this. Is time management really the final core issue of procrastination? I would say this way, a healthy approach to God's way of managing time must dig deeper to get to the root of why we misuse time and why that's even an issue in life. And that's why we need to go to Scripture the scripture that Hebrews 4 tells us is able powerfully to get in there to the thoughts and intents of the heart. To get in there and find out what is at the core, what is at the root of the issues of life. And so we'd have to ask this question. Does God's word make an issue out of procrastination for God's people? And the answer would be absolutely. Absolutely. The writer of this series that I'm using, Phil Mosier, says this, The unwise steward is fearful. The overconfident optimist is prideful. And the poor planner 
is lazy. While each may differ in their motivation, they bring the same result. Put off till tomorrow what could be done today. That's procrastination. So let me ask it this way. Does scripture address the hard issues of fear, pride, and laziness? You better believe it. Similar to our study on anger, the, form, the format of what we're going to look at today starts with God's perspective on procrastination. Then we'll go to God's example of victory over procrastination's, uh, uh, procrastination's temptations. And then we'll end our time today, Lord willing, with God's spirit-empowered habit replacement for the issues of procrastination. Let's pray, and I want to go through each one of those sections. Father, thank you for the privilege and honor of being able to stand before you today to preach and teach your word. Thank you for the privilege and honor for all of us to sit under the teaching of your word. For it is your word that is sufficient for the issues of life. And we all readily admit that we have issues in life. Lord, I pray that today you would help us to break some of those habits within the issues of life in such a way that honors you and is, is in line with your sufficient word. Help us with this content today to walk away continuing down the path of more and more Christ-likeness in our sanctification. We pray this in Jesus' name, for his sake, amen. Notice God's perspective on procrastination. What does God show us about procrastination in his word. And we are going to take a look at a parable. You know what a parable is, right? A parable is often a story. They've, it's been said that a parable is a, a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And that's a very, very broad way to approach a parable. But um, by and large, Jesus is the one who is, is seen teaching with parables in scripture and this is one of them and I want to read for it and see if you can pick out what we might start to um, dissect a little bit about this issue of procrastination so we're in Matthew 25 starting in verse 14 Jesus says for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods and then unto one he gave five talents to another two and to another one to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had five talents, had received five talents, came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. When he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a, a, a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathers, gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and 
he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a lot we could say, I believe, about the application of this parable. This is a kingdom parable. Stewardship, in a, in, a, in a general application of this parable, stewardship of what Jesus has entrusted to his followers in kingdom life as we await his second coming comes out in application of this parable. This parable, at least in part, addresses faithful living for our Savior as we await the return of our Savior. Can there be a lot more we could say about this parable? Sure. But here is a truth. Think about this. Faithful living is a struggle because of all the sinful desires circling around in our hearts. Think about that for a second. Faithful living. So, faithfully stewarding the resources, opportunities, and life that God has entrusted to you and me as followers of Christ is a struggle because of the sinful desires circling around in our hearts. I think James 1 would, sp I think it's James 1, 14 through 16, would speak into that, speaking of the the evil desires and lusts in our hearts that ultimately conceive and bring forth sin and death. But here's another truth. Jesus has saved us and empowered us to something much better than just resting in sinful desire-based living. You know that, right? Jesus has delivered us from the power of sin he has saved us to something better than just wallowing in sinful desire-based living. He has called and empowered us to faithful service to him, including how we use the time and resources he has entrusted to us for his purposes. In this parable, the master, representing our Lord Jesus Christ, goes away and entrusts hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, the equivalent, if we were to parse out what those talents were. He has entrusted ha like half a million dollars to millions of dollars to these three uh, stewards. And he returns sometime later expecting to see that they wisely invested or used his resources. One of them was given five talents, several millions of dollars, it was, he invested it, doubled the money. One was given two talents, still uh, some millions of dollars equivalency, invested, double the money. One was given one talent. Uh, it is believed to be somewhere in the equivalency of a, just over half a million dollars or so. Buried that money and returned it to the master uninvested, unchanged. The first two were commended and rewarded, and the third was reprimanded and condemned. The master actually, in this story, calls him wicked and slothful, and affirms that the actions of the third servant revealed, contrary to what he said, revealed that he failed to recognize who the master really was. He failed to recognize the true character and expectations of the master. Ultimately, it seems that this third servant represents someone who was not really a believer and thus naturally wasted the master's resources of grace. What I'd like to do, though, with this story today is simply highlight the temptations to procrastinate as are illustrated in this story. If you take a look at verses 24 and 25, in the story, this one steward, this third one said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast thy, that is thine. I want to highlight one phrase. You might underline it if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible 
the, that is the phrase, I was afraid. We're talking about fear. Fear was the source of his procrastination. This is not the only occurrence of fear-based procrastination in Scripture. You remember Adam and Eve way back in Genesis? When Adam and Eve hid, instead of looking to God for a solution, Adam says in Genesis chapter 3, I was afraid. Jacob, in I believe it's Genesis 31, when he ran from his father-in-law in the night, instead of seeking a solution, he responds with, I was afraid. You know, fear can be paralyzing. Fear can cause us to put off what should be rightly and faithfully done in God's provision now. Sometimes this fear comes as a result of a sense of inadequacy. When the responsibility or task before us seems too big to tackle, procrastination is often our choice because we trust our own adequacy and quickly find that it does not measure up to the enormity of the task. In other words, what the right thing is to do seems bigger than what we are able to do and we feel very inadequate. The lazy steward got scared when he realized he could not measure up to his master's expectations, so he did nothing. Now, I think we'd all agree that fear is a very real root of procrastination. I, I think we, we see that. Contemporary wisdom would counsel this person to just believe in yourself and you can be or do anything. You can get over this. Just believe in yourself. Do you know what that kind of counsel does? That kind of counsel does nothing but set a person up for more and more disappointment. Because you see, when we look to our own adequacy, we quickly find that we do not measure up. We are weak. We are... We are um, small and powerless compared to many of the tasks that are before us. I think that's why we have encouragement in passages like uh, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3, starting at verse 5, says, Trust in your own heart to get it done, and you'll bring it to pass. Is that what Proverbs 3 says? No. Proverbs 3, starting at verse 5, says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. I am sorry. And lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. There's great encouragement and even combat there for feelings of adequacy when they're not warranted. Gideon knew that the battle belonged to the Lord in Judges 7. David knew that the giant Goliath's insults and ultimate beef was with the Lord and that God would have to give the victory in 1 Samuel 17. In our parable, the master gave resources to the stewards according to their abilities. He knew what they could do and what they uh, could not do and he knew what he was doing. But the procrastinating steward could not see past his own perception of himself. And thus, what did he do? He froze. Well, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if I should do that. So I'll just, I'll just protect it. I'll just put it away. Obviously, we don't need a greater, more trusting view of self. We need a faith filled view of our big powerful wise and loving god sometimes our procrastination stems from fear that is based on our sense of inadequacy but sometimes procrastination grows from a memory of past failures the lie that can creep into our thinking is this you failed before and you'll only fail again. 
We all have past failures and disappointments, don't we? I think if I were to come around to each one of you and have a personal conversation, I think every single one of us could talk about past failures and personal disappointments. Can I lovingly encourage you in this way? The Savior who died and rose again for your sins did so for your sins in the past, did so for your sins in the present, and sufficiently did so for your sins in the future. Let me read to you 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Can I tell you what's not in that statement from 1 John 4? 1 John 4 that says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. It does not say, Greater self-confidence pushes out fear. You know what it says? It says, Perfect love casts out fear. Hmm. What do we do with that? What is perfect love? I know of only one place to see and experience perfect love. And I think Romans 5.8 sheds some light on that. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth or shows his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know where perfect love that casts out fear is found? Right there at the cross, the Savior of the cross. That's the only place I know to find perfect love. A perfect demonstration of love is when God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mosier says often because of past failures, a person is afraid to try. They aren't motivated by perfect love. They're motivated by their own perfection. Again, our prospect of victory is not, should not ever be based on our own ability, but on the perfect sacrifice and power of our Savior. Our perceptions of ourselves can lead to paralyzing fear that stops us from moving forward in our service and stewardship for the Lord. That's why we need to be especially suspect of our self-perceptions. And to make sure they are rooted in scripture and not our own conclusions about ourselves. Oftentimes, we walk around with and approach situations with this puffed up view of ourselves. And let me tell you, you're setting yourselves up for great, great disappointment. Because it is not ourselves that deserves our sense of worth and our sense of ability. It is the perfect love of our Savior. 1 John 4.18 does not say your sense of being able to get things done is what casts out fear. No, perfect love casts out fear. And I don't know about you, but in fact, actually I do know about you because I know about me. Scripture teaches me that there is no perfection in me in and of myself. There is no sense of perfect ability in and of myself. That perfect love is only given to us through Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us on, on our behalf. Perfect love casts out fear. I think we need to be very, very careful of walking forward in this confidence of I've got it figured out in our relationships, in our abilities, in our approach to life, we often walk around with this false sense of confidence. We need to be especially suspect of our self-perceptions and make sure they are rooted in Scripture and not our own conclusions. That's why simple time management adjustment will likely not correct our procrastination because tackling the unbiblical fear at the heart level is the greater need. There is unbiblical fear circling around in the desires of our heart. A 
I've got two more motivators that I want to go over with you here. Time would prevent us from being able to flesh out these other two like we've done with procrastination. But let me point them out to you. One, which is actually number two, of root issues that are temptations toward um, procrastination is overconfidence. We can call that pride. Overconfidence or pride says, I'll have the opportunity to do it later. This approach to life puts oneself in the position of God, assuming they know what the future will hold. Oh, I can do that later. I will have the time to do that later. I will have opportunity to do that down the road. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you made a decision based on that assumption even this week? Let me just say this. Preparing for this message has been absolutely miserable this week. You know why? To borrow a phrase from my dad, maybe you'll get this, maybe you won't. I get it because I heard it all the time. But he would often say when something is greatly affected by something, he said, man, like let's just say someone had a, a bad disease, right? Maybe cancer or something. He said, man, that person is eat up with cancer. You ever heard a phrase similar to that? That person is just eaten up with cancer. You know what? As I began to really look at procrastination, I realized I am eaten up. I am just plum eat up with procrastination, with the issues of procrastination. Maybe you're sitting there looking at me like, good for you. I don't struggle with it. Okay, that's fine, but I think an honest look at, scripture, a look at Scripture says, no, I think we have a struggle here. I think we have issues. James chapter 4 addresses this overconfidence and pride. It says in verse 13 of James 4, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Oftentimes, we assume the place of God when we say, oh, I'll just do that later. What we're doing is in, in the overconfidence of our heart saying, I got this. I'll have time to do it later. The key to remember is this, that we are not our own, that we're certainly not in control of our own time and our destiny, and we do far better to submissively conform our use of time and resources to what God has laid out on, in his word, not on how we feel in the moment. Again, I don't know about you, but my feelings in the moment often cause me to put off till later what I could do now, what I should do now in honoring God with my use of time. I don't know. Is this resonating with you at all or is it just me? The other root I think we could find at the core of, of procrastination is laziness that says either I don't feel like it, thus I'll do it later, or I don't want to do the harder task, so I'll busy myself with something else that needs to be done. This is the second issue, laziness. And laziness sometimes surfaces in a way that we least expect it. Sometimes someone who is considered a very, very hard worker at the core is very lazy. You say, that doesn't make any sense, Pastor. Let me read for you what Moser says. Moser says, we're all prone to laziness. It just may be hiding where we least expect it. The hardworking employee may struggle to put in that same effort with his family. Perhaps a dad procrastinates on the hard work of developing a relationship around his son's interests until it's too late. Or a wife may give hours to developing ministry opportunities with other women, but might find conversations with her husband to be difficult and burdensome. Pride tells us we're working hard, when in truth we may only be working hard at the things that come easy to us or that we enjoy. 
So could it be under the guise of hard work ethic, we're actually putting off the hard things in place of the easy things? Just because we work hard doesn't mean we're working faithfully. Does that make sense? Proverbs chapter 6, starting in verse 6, says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which, having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in, in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth in and thy want as one as an armed man. Yes, a strong work ethic is a good thing, but planning ahead to do even the hard thing in that work ethic is a part of that diligence and faithfulness for the Lord. It's stewardship of God's resources, all of them, not just the ones we find easy to do. There's four perspective reminders here for God's stewards. Number one, the procrastinator must remember that God is sovereign over time, but he is not. A perspective corrector is to realize the only one that can assume tomorrow is God. He is sovereign over our time, and we need to remember that we as procrastinators are not. Number two, the procrastinator must see time as an opportunity to prepare for the future, not simply to enjoy today's pleasures. The procrastinator must see time as an opportunity to prepare for the future, not simply to enjoy, indulge in today's pleasures. Number three, the procrastinator must develop a useful plan for whatever time remains. The procrastinator must develop a useful time, a plan for whatever time remains. And number four, the procrastinator must understand that there are unavoidable consequences if he doesn't prepare in advance. There are unavoidable consequences for not preparing in advance. And I think you could go back to that passage in Proverbs about the ant and find these principles. I would hope that you would let perspectives like that, grabbing a hold of God's perspective of procrastination, to drive you to a repentant but faith-filled approach to stewarding the resources God has given you. Realizing that what God has given you by way of resources, that's time, that's relational opportunities, that's vocational uh, opportunities and, and, and circumstances, all of that, those are examples of God's grace that he's given to you and empowered you to steward for his glory. So it, it's very likely that all of us would be in need today of a repentant spirit about that. Like, Lord, yes, yes, I have blown this. I have blown opportunities to be a steward for your glory. But then to say, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be faithful. Thank you for giving me the opportunity in Christ to know that my position before you is not affected by my performance. It was secured by Jesus' performance. And Lord, would you help me then, because of that, to spring forward in faithfulness for you? I know we have a lot to, to still do today, and there's a part of me that wants to just keep going, but there's another part that says, let's, let's chew on this. I know we have the Lord's Supper, and we have some other things to, to go over today. So... I am going to, to pause there, but don't pause your mind. Don't pause your mind here. How many of you, interact with me for just a second. How many of you would say, Pastor, as I'm thinking about whether it's fear, whether it's pride and over, overconfidence, or whether it's laziness, I'm identifying at least one area where I've got an issue with procrastination. How many of you would just honestly say, yeah, yeah, you, I, I'd say there's likely not very many of us that would not be able to admit that in, in all reality. 
I am so glad that Jesus died for my fear. I'm so glad he died for my sinful interaction with pride. I'm so glad that Jesus died for my sinful interaction with laziness. Aren't you? I think that's the comfort we all need to rest in today. So there, there's a, there, there is a rejoicing in the rescue of Jesus from these issues, but I think there is a repentant response of, Lord, would you help me then for your glory this week to step off of that because you've given me the victory already to live the way you've designed me to live all for your glory for the sake of showing Christ both to myself and to those around me. Would you, would you agree there's a motivation there to live for the Lord based on what he's already done for us? Please be careful. Don't walk away thinking, oh, I'm going to live that way so that I can get from the Lord, so that I can be right with the Lord. No, you, the be right and the get happened at the cross. But the desire to follow the Lord in love and worship and to live out his best for his glory, all of that comes because of the cross too. And we have the, we have the opportunity to be faithful because of the Jesus of the cross. Amen? Amen? Would you bow with me for just a second? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand or anything like that right now, but I wonder how many of you would just internally respond to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I'm eat up. I am just plumb eat up with procrastination in one way or another. Lord, I, I, I struggle with this, and you know that, Lord. But Father, I know that when I take the yoke of Jesus upon myself, I realize it's not on my shoulders. It's what Jesus has already done and continues to do for me. And Lord, this week, I want to rest in who I am in Christ and let that motivate me to live for the glory of Christ, even in how I use the resources you've entrusted to me. Would you take a moment and just respond to the Lord in your own heart about that? Lord, as she just played at the piano, I would humbly but loudly exclaim, I need thee every hour. Oh, every hour I need thee. Lord, my problem is I often feel confident in my own abilities. Lord, I pray this week that both myself, as having preached and studied this passage, and all of us who are listening to and learning from this passage and this, these truths, that you would help us this week to not wallow in the pit of self-pity, but to joyfully rejoice in the provision of Jesus Christ to live the way you've designed us to live. For it's not in our merit or ability in any shape or form, but all because of you. We get to do what you've called us to do because you provided the means to do that through the provision and righteousness of Jesus. Help us to repent, rejoice, and rest. Living a life of faithfulness with the resources you've entrusted to us this coming week. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.